very intimidating for someone from Oxford to be here with all this new exciting technology going on. <laughs> right I'll try and keep up. Um, thank you very much. It's very exciting to be on uh, this panel with many distinguished speakers and also to be working with International Idea again. And that was really the inspiration for all of this work. I'm sure my colleague's going to talk more about that in a minute, so I'll stick specifically to talking about our project. But suffice to say, it's going to be more like 12 minutes than 10, because this is a research project that takes in four countries from different continents, and trying to compress that down into a set of easy to um, digest morsels isn't that easy. So I'm going to try and give you essentially a snapshot of what we've done, and I hope that that will inspire you and encourage you to go and read all of the materials that are actually available on the International Idea website. So we have four country case studies, a chapter for each of the countries I'm going to talk about. We have a long overview introduction to those. We also now have a summary report of all of that and a conclusion and so on that International Idea put together. So if you're interested, please do go there. And please remember that if you think I'm horribly caricaturing a country that you know very well, I probably am, but it's in the context of 12 minutes. Very quickly before I begin, I'd like to recognize my co-author here, Dan Paget, who did all this work with me, um, and we very much did it together. So, why do we care? Why do we care about whether or not parties are programmatic, right? It's worth starting with the motivation for this research, I think, from idea side and also why we wanted to do it. Um, and generally speaking, you know, we expect that clientelistic party systems have three key features that make programmatic party systems better. What are those three key features? Well, one, clientelistic systems feature elections in which you rarely see the generation of debates over important issues such as economic policy. Two, elections are more likely to foster corruption and neo-patrimonial politics. That's because of the nature of clientelistic parties which have to use funds to generate support by buying votes, for example, which requires high levels of resource flows. And three, as a result of one and two combined, the quality of policy, scrutiny, and accountability is typically lower when we're talking about clientelistic systems. Now, that's a horrendous generalization, but <laughs> it's broadly true if we survey 30, 40 different countries' political systems in the developing world. But, of course, to know what it means to say that programmatic parties might be in some way an improvement on clientelistic parties, we need to say what they are. Now, typically, we know what a clientelistic party is. We're talking about a party that mobilizes support by going out there and giving money, votes, some, uh, in return for votes, something like that. Maybe that money isn't the key form of exchange in that relationship. It may be something else is. Land, for example, resources, other forms of development may, in some cases, be uh, the, cu the currency of that exchange. But it's about resources for votes. But what do we mean then when we say programmatic parties? What does it mean to say this? Some people use a shorthand, which is a policy-based party, right? But that's slightly confusing in the sense that a policy can cover almost anything. So International Idea and others who worked on this project, for Luna and others, came up with a schema that we broadly follow here, which is that to be fully programmatic, a party must fulfill three criteria. The first criteria is a strong link between the party and its constituents. A programmatic link, in other words, that the constituents are built, brought into the party and able in some way to influence party policy. Two, that the internal organisation of the party is in some way rule-based and democratic. And of course, these are all sliding scales and we can imagine parties at one end or the other of all of these scales. And three, that the policy process and the platform that result reflect the engagement of party members. In other words, that party members aren't simply engaged, but their views help to form the party platform. So when we're talking about programmatic parties, we're talking about, in a sense, these three different dimensions. It's not just that the party is programmatic in the policies it puts forward at election time, it's that it uses those to mobilize voters, rather than, for example, developing these kind of ideas, but then still mobilizing voters in an old-fashioned clientelistic way, which is a hybrid form that we see in some systems. Now, one thing you can see very quickly is that we could have a political party that's very high on some of these scales and very low on others. We can have a party like Congress in India that puts forward some uh, programmatic policies but doesn't have programmatic linkages to constituencies. It has clientelistic linkages. And in, when we're evaluating then how programmatic a party is, it's quite difficult. And how you want to rate and rank different parties in terms of their programmaticity, which is an ugly, horrible word, but forgive me, <laughs> programmaticity, right? How you rank them <laughs> depends on which of these three criteria you think is most important because some parties are going to be high on one and low on the other. 
but we can probably all agree that a party that's high on all three is a really programmatic party. Okay, that's laid the foundation. What's the research? We went to four countries, and we went to these countries because we were looking for a broad range of experiences with different outcomes when it comes to the level of uh, basically programmaticity and institutionalization of party systems. So we were looking for variation on that, and we went to Brazil, India, Ukraine, and Zambia. And we were particularly interested in countries that have had relatively recent experiences of seeing the development of more programmatic forms of parties. That's another thing that informed this choice. We can talk more about these four countries later, but for lack of time, I'm going to move on now. What are the main contributions that our paper makes? I'm going to highlight the contributions and talk a bit more about one of the main things that we talk about in the body of the paper. We think we have three contributions. First is to point out that parties can be ethnic and programmatic at the same time. Typically, you see literature that talks about ethnic parties, bad, fostering ethnic division, so on, programmatic parties, good, policy-based debates, economic debates, fosters accountability and good governance. But we also see in countries where we see an overlap between class and ethnicity. Think of India, think of many African countries where divide and rule politics has created certain ethnic groups that are worse off economically than other ethnic groups. When you get a system like that, a society like that, it may well be that appeals to the poor overlap with the appeals to certain ethnic communities. In those contexts, for example, ethnic appeals and programmatic appeals may appear be completely consistent and put forward by the same parties to the same constituencies. So it's not that we always have a programmatic party or an ethnic party. We may have ethnic programmatic parties. And one of the things we really try and do in the piece is talk about, OK, what's the difference between a party that's programmatic but ethnic, that's programmatic but civic, and what do those two party types mean for the impact of those parties on long-term democratization and the quality of government? So that's the first contribution. Um, and well, our key conclusion there is the need to distinguish and keep in mind between ethnic programmatic and civic programmatic parties. I'll come back to that later. The second is that a programmatic party does not make a programmatic party system. What do we mean? There's a general assumption in some of the literature that once you get a programmatic party or two, the natural advantages of these parties, and the advantage is that it's supposed to be cheaper to run a programmatic party than a clientelistic party, because you're running the party based on promises to the voters and policies rather than on financial transactions, that you then get a programmatic party system. In most of our cases, programmatic parties coexist over time with ethnic parties and clientelistic parties and often lose out to them. <coughs> So our message here is, yes, programmatic parties have some advantages, but actually a small number may not outweigh ethnic and clientelistic parties, especially if programmatic parties don't win power early. And I'll talk more about that later. The third key contribution we think we make is to point out that not all programmatic parties are equally likely to inspire the sustainable transformation of the party system. And this brings me back to my ma our main point that we need to focus on the nature of the programmatic party. Is it an ethnic programmatic party, or is it a civic programmatic party? And what does that mean for the future of the party system? I'm going to talk more about that now. So the two key things that we think are really important here when thinking through how do parties develop, how do they evolve, what does that mean, are the types of linkages parties construct to voters, and whether or not they build strong ties to civil society groups early on in their careers. And we develop this rough typology. So for those who are in the business, it's a classic political science two by two. We, <laughs> we apologize for that. Um, and there are two stages, in a sense, that we're thinking about here. The first is when the party develops, does it establish a strong connection to a specific ethnic group or not? The second is when it evolves, does it evolve out of civil society and out of existing civil society organizations? For example, movement for democratic change in Zimbabwe evolves out of the Stop the Constitution movement. It has an established civil society organization in place when it becomes a political party under Morgan Changre. Does it have that or does it not? And these two options give us four outcomes. One, in which you see weak linkages to ethnic groups. In other words, it's not an ethnic programmatic party. And also where we see a strong buy-in of civil society groups. And those parties tend to become what we call civic institutionalized. Why civic? Well, because they tend to represent more a national constituency rather than an ethnic particularistic constituency. 
And why institutionalized? Well, because they bring in a strong civil society organization and build that in at the very beginning of their existence, they tend to have stronger internal structures and more developed networks. Bring, for example, MMD in Zambia initially building on trade union networks under the Zambia Congress of Trade Unions is a classic example. But we also see you know, initial support base being much more civic, but low levels of integration. And where we see those low levels of integration of civil society groups, we expect, again, a civic party, but maybe a weakly institutionalized party, a party that doesn't have a strong internal democracy, doesn't have a strong organization. And finally, the next two categories are similar, but on the ethnic side. We see parties that are, to some extent, captured by one ethnic group, or typically are seen as being aligned to one ethnic group. But these may be more institutionalized, where they do build in a strong civil society component early on, or less institutionalized where they don't. So what I'm going to talk about now, just to conclude, is the four, those four types of parties and what they mean for the party system and for long-term democratization. So when fledgling parties don't establish links to ethnic communities and do form strong ties, they form institutionalized civic programmatic parties. This is the type of party we think is most effective at developing a programmatic party system in which policy-based politics becomes the order of the day and we see a decline in clientelism and an improvement in good governance. And a classic example here would be the development of the PT, the Workers' Party in Brazil, and the impact that has within Brazil in terms of developing initially a more of a left-right spectrum and over time implementing policies like Bolsa Familia that are clearly targeted to improve the conditions of poor uh, Brazilians. So that, in a sense, is the ideal type. But many programmatic parties don't actually conform to that ideal type. We see them conforming to one of the other three. So for example, when programmatic parties integrate the support of an ethnic group but also have some strong ties to civil society, they're more likely to emerge as institutionalized ethnic programmatic parties. And here we think the BJP is a good example. It does have roots in civil society organizations formed as far back as 1925, but it also clearly has a Hindu base that it panders to at the same time as putting forward more programmatic policies targeted either towards the poor in some cases or in terms of looking at its foreign policy and campaigning for a stronger Indian foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis other countries. So we see a party that emerges that is strong and fairly institutionalized, but at the same time is, has strong ethnic base. It has clear programmatic elements, but it is not a civic party as we've defined it. And the danger of such as a party, and we're seeing this in India right now, is that it may be electorally successful, it may advance more programmatic goals than some clientelistic parties, but it may also polarize the country around ethnicity. And that in turn may have consequences for political stability and the quality of governance. There's also a problem internal to parties like that. And the internal problem is that a party that's initially captured by an ethnic constituency may struggle to retain its programmatic nature over time. It may find that when it gets into power, for example, it's very difficult to retain that programmatic focus when the pressure comes from its own ethnic support base to redistribute resources to them given their electoral support over time. So we see this as being quite an unstable and difficult and problematic form of programmatic politics. Finally, to wrap up this bit, when programmatic parties don't initially integrate ethnic groups and fail to form strong ties, we think we see, obviously, non-institutionalized civic programmatic parties, the BSDP in Brazil, Congress in India. These parties have something to offer from the point of programmatic politics. They do actually put forward some programmatic goals, but they don't integrate their own citizens and voters into that process in the form of programmatic <coughs> politics and programmatic linkages. So we see, as I talked about in the case of Congress, we see a coexistence of clientelistic linkages at the local level with programmatic policies at the national level. And what that means is that you get less of an effect to programmatic politics on the grassroots. You get less, it's less likely in that context to see the demands of the poorest sectors of community reflected in national policy. So although this is good to some extent, it's a fairly weak form of programmatic politics. But it's a civic form, and in that sense it doesn't have some of the downsides of the ethnic politics I mentioned a moment ago. So the final category here is the non-institutionalized ethnic programmatic party. In some ways, this is the worst of all worlds. <laughs> it's non-institutionalized in the sense that it doesn't have that strong buy-in of civil society, so it doesn't have a strong internally democratic systems, and that's problematic in terms of whether or not we see programmatic policies safeguarded in the future. And it also risks being captured by a single ethnic group, 
and in that sense diverting away from programmatic politics to patronage politics. And a classic example here, which we're seeing right now in government as we speak, is the Patriotic Front government in Zambia, which won power under Michael Sata, had a very programmatic agenda, but is being accused by other communities of having taken all of the key government positions for member speakers who have the same identity as the president. So very quickly, some policy recommendations. Where does all this get us? Well, obviously on structural determinants, there are some things that we just can't do. And one of the things that the international idea asked us to look at is, what can we actually practically do? So it's one thing to say you're less likely to get programmatic po politics in poor rural areas with low access to information, but we can't change poverty very quickly, and we can't change what we might want to over time with the MDGs, but we're you know, unlikely to change it very quickly. And as party pr assistance providers and democracy promotion advisors don't have that much capacity to change poverty, don't necessarily have that much um, capacity to change some of the other key development things you might think are important. So these are specifically things that we think could be done by democracy promotion um, and, and party assistance providers in terms of changing um, the opportunities to facilitate more programmatic parties around the world. Um, one, you know, we know that promoting civic programmatic parties is typically easier in urban areas and rural ones. But the reverse may be true for ethnic programmatic parties. Some of our ethnic programmatic parties that we identify develop their strongest bases in rural areas. So the first message is not to ignore rural-based politics and rural, um, rural mobilization, and also not to assume that rural mobilization is always going to be non-programmatic. There is a tendency in some of the literature towards that assumption that urban politics is trade union based and therefore more policy based. It's not always the case. Um, but we also suggest that things that could be done to try and reverse some of the issues and problems we see in terms of developing programmatic politics in rural areas would be to really work on media access. This is something that started to happen over the last 20 years because of the liberalization of FM radio, the development of community radio, and so on. But one of the key things that we need to improve in rural areas if we're going to develop more programmatic parties is better information and more diverse sources of information so that people there can engage in the same kinds of political debates that are happening in urban areas. Second, looking at party genesis. One of the things that's really interesting about our research is that we don't find that the programmatic parties are established parties that become more programmatic once they become established. They're, they're typically new parties that enter the party system having identified a specific need and then go on to fill it. The Patriotic Front in Zambia is a good example. It was very clear for a long time in Zambia that there existed a constituency that was anti-IMF, pro-state intervention, anti-China. And yet none of the main political parties ever moved to represent that constituency. Michael Sata then created the PF and filled that gap. But it wasn't a gap filled by an existing political party moving over to a different part of the party spectrum. It was filled by a new party. So it's important that party assistance um, providers don't simply work with the big established parties, but also recognize that typically pro programmatization, if we can use that horrible word again, comes from new parties and new entrants in the party system. Um, so the second thing we suggest here is that actually those parties can be helped by providing them with the ability to do research to actually identify which gaps aren't currently being filled by parties within the party system. Zambia, again, is a very good example. It was very clear here that there was a constituency that could be represented by a political party on a more programmatic platform. Assistance could be given to parties in other countries to identify the untapped programmatic constituencies where they operate. And finally, you know, donors are relatively well placed to help build relationships between civil society organizations and political parties. This is particularly important because of what we said about the nature of the institutionalization of programmatic parties, which typically comes when they evolve out of existing civil society organizations and can use and rely on those networks. What about party institutionalization? You know, one of the things we've been talking about is how to actually strengthen the internal democracy of parties to safeguard the programmatic elements of their programs. Well, we know that this can be promoted at times through legislative and electoral rules that enable party leaders to enforce party discipline. This is important because if party leaders are going to deliver on the promises their parties make in elections, they need in some way to be able to control their own MPs. So party discipline is often something that helps the development of programmatic parties over time. And you can think of how disciplined parties are, for example, in the UK or in the US, relative to some of the party systems that we talk about um, in the paper. But 
it's also important to remember that that goal of establishing effective parties that are able to vote coherently, which of course is essential in a way for accountability and the delivery of manifesto promises, has to be counterbalanced with a focus on the internal democracy within the party. Otherwise, what we end up doing is empowering leaders at the expense of activists and party members. So it needs to be a twofold approach. On the one hand, supporting leaders and parties to be able to act coherently. On the other hand, supporting party members to be able to actually actively participate in the formation of policy within those parties. So we need, in a sense, to avoid the rock and the hard place and try and find a way through the middle that combines those two. And if we can, we're likely to find a way of institutionalizing programmatic gains that parties have made. So just to conclude, it's obviously very difficult to do this. Um, one of the things that we don't want to come across as suggesting is that this kind of party assistance work is easy. You know, political parties face a tremendous number of challenges in all of the countries that we look at from high <coughs> barriers of entry, from the ability of parties that already have power to use the advantages of incumbency <coughs> to lock them out and so on. And we also don't mean to undermine the significance of those structural foundations, poverty, lack of development, low levels of education, that often make it more difficult to get programmatic politics off the ground. But one of the things that's interesting in all four of our cases is that despite unpromising contexts, despite many of the structural problems the literature would classically look at and say that's going to make it almost impossible to get programmatic politics off the ground, programmatic parties not only emerge, they succeed. And in two or three of our cases, have already won power, in the third, maybe about to. Thank you very much.